Hello everybody, welcome to Never Stop Building. My name's Jason and we're gonna be jumping back on the timber frame pergola project. If you're just joining us now, there's a couple more videos in this series where we make the stone foundations and the posts. Uh, and I also have a set of plans available for mid-tier Patreon subscribers so that you can follow along. So check out that if you're interested. In this video, we're gonna be finishing up the rest of the frame components. So you've just been watching me do the majority of the layout on the cross brace. This is the piece that goes in those two small pockets that we made on the round post in the last videos. Once I've finished the layout, I can move on to drilling out and then cutting the two peg holes. After that, I will cut the shoulders for these through tenons and then rip top and bottom to create those tenons. As compared to a blind tenon, the amount of effort that you're gonna to have to put into making it super clean and super square is much higher for a through tenon because you see the tenon poking out the other side of the frame. So not only does it need to look good on the outside, but it needs to pass through the mortise cleanly and in a way that the anything in the mortise doesn't damage the surface. So I spend a lot of time fine-tuning these tenons, planing them, uh, checking them for square. They are both a structural and a decorative element when the whole thing is assembled. Having finished the two tenons on either end of this cross brace, I moved on to roughing out the curve on the bottom side. So the way I laid this out was I took a ruler and ran a string between the two ends of it and twisted that string up with a little peg and that bent the ruler and then I could use that to create my curve line. And now I just am taking sort of large breadboard cuts to remove the bulk of the waste. I cut a bunch of lines and chip it out with a, a chisel. And I'm, then I'm gonna come back with the router uh, as deep as the bit that I had could go on both sides. I just kind of followed the line and trimmed away as much as I could before moving on to more hand tools to clean up the middle. I brought in a draw knife to remove the extra material between those two cuts and then I was trying to smooth everything out. I think I used the uh, yeah I used the um, the spear plane to try to smooth everything out. Eventually I switched to a fairly sharp spoke shave to really smooth out that curve. It's a very slight curve, but it, it definitely is apparent in the finished product. It's a little hard to see here because my GoPro that I was filming with this with, uh, with its lens kind of makes everything look like it has a curve. So the only real curve in these members is gonna be the one I'm working on here. After the curve was finished, I planed down both surfaces and then moved on to hand planing everything for finish and finally wrapping everything up with paper to prepare for install. So that's the completed cross brace. The next member I needed to work on was the main beams, probably one of the more complicated pieces and it's also humongous. This is a, I believe it was a 12 foot long, 12 by 12 Port Orford Cedar. I couldn't even get it in the shop. I, I chopped the ends off with a chainsaw outside uh, before m maneuvering it in with the timber cart into where I could work on it. This whole piece is going to be laid out off of a center line. So the first thing I did as far as laying out was use the level to create my horizontal center line on both ends and then a perpendicular center line to that. Once I had a center line established, um, I could lay out the exact square dimensions of the timber because I believe there was some twist and some some uh, warpage in this piece so I needed to create a a flat reference surface that I could then plane down and make a square piece. So with lines snapped around and knowing where I needed to remove material I would go back and forth between the ends with a power planer or a hand plane and start to cut, start to work down the high spots 
and checking along the whole length of the timber with uh, the square to make sure that the two edges were square to each other. Of all the pieces in this whole frame, I would say this main support beam was probably the most complicated to lay out. In addition to the two mortises on the bottom side that the posts would go into, on the top side, there were four different half lap joints, all with a different driving angle because the main beams of the pergola splayed out from this and widened as they got towards the house. And the way I dealt with that was I very accurately set the angle from a digital angle gauge onto one of four bevel gauges. Here I am cutting both ends of the beam. Each end has a an angled cut that makes for a decorative finish. And you can see where I've done a lot of cross cuts to remove the waste in that half lap joint. Once those cross cuts were in there, I could just chip out all that extra material. Then I switched to a router with the depth set so that I could completely clear out the rest of the waste and have a smooth finish on that joint. My router has this thick, I think it's 3 8 inch, 8 millimeter uh, Lexan base. Very easy to make. You just uh, use a hole saw to cut a hole in the center and then use a, a cone jig for the router to line it up and then drill your holes. And then you have a lot more support where the router base spans both sides of the cut and you can have a lot of control by putting one hand on the base and using your other hand to move the router around. These half left joints you can imagine as two cupped hands clasping together. Uh, there's this little step detail that I'm chiseling out right here, and that is so that the top big beams, when they sit down on this joint, uh, the gap is horizontal. So when you look up from the bottom, you don't really see any gaps as the as the wood may cons, uh, expand and contract. If you had a had a pure half lap joint, then there'd be a vertical separation as the uh, beam expands and contracts over time. This way, that's kind of hidden, and it will it will open up and close as the humidity changes, but. I, I kind of designed the joints so that when somebody's looking at them from the angle of a human being, you minimize those gaps and reveals. And this is the same mentality I use to cut the mortise joints where the posts are gonna go. So the first thing I do is I start by chiseling out the line where the mortise is gonna be. And I chop out a very clean mortise to about the depth of a router bearing. Then I use a drill to hog out the majority of the waste down into the hole, right up into the corners. That's probably why I'm using a small drill bit here, and then a big one. Then I take a router with a bearing and use the nicely cut top of the mortise to, as a guide to cut deep into the mortise. And I kind of go as far as I can with uh, the router bearing there. And that establishes a very nice vertical. And then I can use big chisels to kind of clear out the waste farther into the hole. This, I do this mortise first, and then I have a template that I made from the tops of the posts. Uh, I recess those posts slightly into the beam, so they kind of go up inside the beam. Uh, that is so that you can't really see. If you'd have to, you have to go close to the post and look up to see the gaps versus seeing separation between the top of the post and the beam as it moves with time. Also then water and snow and other stuff won't blow into that space between them. Hopefully there shouldn't be any space between them because we're gonna draw bore them with these big pegs, but it's sort of a cleaner look to have them drop down on the round posts like that. Again, a great use of the router with the large clear base to hog out all the material uh, to a specific depth. Then I come back with my curved chisel to clean up right to the line. So with a major joinery done on this large upper beam on for the gate, I then just hand plane all the surfaces 
hand plane the ends smooth and then wrap the whole thing with protective paper except for the areas where uh, joints are going to inter intersect and this piece is complete. All right, the last parts of this pergola frame to fabricate are the, the huge spanning beams that go between this gate and the house that will support the pergola rafters that do the pergolaing, the shade providing. Uh, these were huge, so you can see that I, I can't even fit them in the shop. I had to do this out, all outside. Thank goodness this was Colorado sunny summer weather where you can leave everything outside forever and it's beautiful. You'll also notice that that shop looks like it's under construction. I've, I was redoing the apartment above for my friend, so there's a, another video where I touch on that. If you're interested, check out the link above. So, yes. First thing I did was I did all the layout on these. Each of these beams, again, have a different angle that the half lap joint is cut at, in addition to a different angle that the end gets cut to so that the ends of the beams as they overhang the gate are all uh, in a plane and then a similar matching angle against the house where they meet the house at the same plane and there's also a little relief there for the metal brackets that attach them to the house that I made in a previous video. Uh, so these beams were large. I think they were between 18 and 20 feet long, eight by tens. I should mention that this whole pergola is chunky, more chunky than I would have liked. And I think ultimately that came down to it having to have uh, stamped engineering drawings approved by the city to get all of our permits squared away. And, you know, obviously when the engineer's name is on something, they don't want to take any risks. And timber framing to begin with is very tricky to get approved because most people don't understand how the joints work and you know they have to look up the certain strengths of the certain cedars and this isn't graded wood per se so it was very uh, annoying because ultimately we had to huge huge timbers whereas much smaller timbers probably would have been just fine um, because it's not really supporting anything but some very thin lightweight rafters so there's no loads other than a snow load and you're not gonna have a lot of a snow accumulation on uh, a ceiling that has huge slots in it but i digress so here i've moved all the timbers uh two sawhorses in this big open space and i've started by cutting all the ends to the correct angles here I'm roughing out those reliefs I talked about where they sit on the brackets against the house. So again, a lot of breadboard cuts, chip it out, and then clean it up to be flat. After I rough all the cuts out, I use uh, the side cutter plane and chisels to clean up and make a nice uh, smooth seat. Here I am applying anchor seal to the ends of these beams. Uh, it's a sort of paraffin based sealing agent that you often use on the end of logs uh, so that they they don't check badly while they're drying out and I don't want the ends of these beams to to start splitting or anything like that so it's to protect the wood and the process for cutting the half lap joints on the underside of these uh, big support beams is the same as all the half lap joints on the the large gate beam just sort of upside down in reverse. And that's why it was helpful to keep that the angle set on those four large angle gauges so that I could just use that same gauge for all the different layout and make sure the joints uh, intersected appropriately. Next on to cleaning out the little seat pocket that uh, where the half lap joint intersects in there and that's just a matter of chiseling out, cleaning up everything. I was so focused on this joint, I did not even realize that my daughter was over there in that concrete bucket playing with the Sashagane, which I hope uh, instills some, uh, some life lessons in her. Very cute. Each of the ends were power plane down flat, and that's why I have this board clamped to the, to the end there so that when the planer comes across, it doesn't blow out the wood. Again, these ends get the anchor seal treatment to keep the 
splitting to a minimum, although you can already see some checks in it, and uh, the brutal dryness of Colorado weather is going to take its toll one way or the other. Once the joinery was cut on all these beams, it was time for the lengthy finishing process uh, to get them ready for install. So I laid out this joinery on center lines. You can see these those black lines running down the length of the, the beams there. So I did not square these up first because this is, you know, on this timber frame style, it's very different from furniture. You're getting to the point where you can't have these perfect posts every time. And it would be a, a really laborious effort to square up these large posts just for the layout purpose. So all the joinery was laid out based on two invisible planes that bisect uh, in the X and Y direction, I guess you could say. Uh, once all the joinery was cut, you know, little variations in the size of the beams was pushed to the outside of the joinery. And since these half lap joints just overlap, that won't get into the way. Um, so to start the finishing process, I, I use a power plane to smooth out all the beams to clean them up. And I did make sure that the tops of the beams, once assembled, would all be in the same plane so that all the rafters on the pergola would be on the same flat surface. So that was where I did take off some material. But on the sides, I wasn't as concerned about that. It was mostly just a cleanup effort. After power planing all the pieces, then it was time for some serious hand planing. And this was, I don't know if I filmed a whole bunch of it because it started to get dark, but it was a lot of work and there was knots um, and I had to resharpen a couple times. So I, I, wet, I probably wetted down these posts to get the knots softer a little bit and then hand planed everything. And finally and unfortunately, we had to put a exterior finish on these. I did my best to try to convince that it was unnecessary, that all the wood is going to turn gray anyway, but it, you know, I, it was not my decision. So as the day began to fade away and the sun got lower in the sky, I finished up all the planing and applied the exterior finish. I think it was a, supposed to be a clear deck finish of some sort. Um, it did not really change the color of the wood. It sort of made the wood look like it would after sitting out in the sun for a little while. And so that is all the pieces done. The next day I test fitted and installed and then cut the threaded rod for these mounting brackets that attach the beams to the house, made sure that they fit correctly and were bolted in place. You will notice on these long support beams that many of them have long checks that run down their entire length. A lot of them are heart center, and there is just no way to avoid, uh, at, the, at the price point for these posts, some, some big cracks and checks. And one of the reasons that the previous pergola failed and rotted away was because it was a combination of there being large checks in these logs, uh, and also there was a finish that really didn't get worn away on the underside, and my theory is that water and snow worked their way into the cracks and then was sort of held inside the logs by the finish on the underside, which exacerbated the rot. And so I really wanted to make sure that that wasn't gonna to happen to this one. And also the client wanted to make sure that this was gonna be more resilient than the previous pergola. So I was thinking we gotta put some flashing on these large beams so that when it inevitably snows, you know, three feet in Colorado, the water doesn't just sit on the surface and then melt back inside the beams. Uh, so we decided on copper, which was super awesome. I'm really glad we went that direction because it's going to be beautiful once it weathers to a, to a nice green. And the house itself has some of that green in it, so it'll really coordinate well. We got a roll of flashing copper, and I basically just rolled it out on the top of the beams. Then I slowly worked my way with some, a nice set of sheet metal shears to cut these pieces to the right width and then used a wide sheet metal bender to bend the edges down to make a lip along the tops of the the beams and hammered it to make it all neat on the end so there was a nice copper cap and then you can see that they're not completely covered here because those parts of the beams go underneath the roof overhang 
or sorry, those go underneath the second story bump up overhang where the pergola attaches. And at that point, I'm bending up the copper so that it can tuck underneath some other flashing near the gutter and shed water correctly uh, off the house. The other part that needed the copper treatment, of course, was the main gate upper beam. Uh, and this was a little trickier. So this one, well, there are two things going on here. So so I rolled out the, the big sheet of copper on top of the beam and then found my marks and laid it out as a wood piece of wood as I would a piece of wood. And then cut all those pieces to fit where the joints would be. Uh, I left each piece a little long so that I could both turn down the edges around the uh, edge of the beam on the ends and on the sides but also where the half lap joints were I turned a bit of the sheet metal up and then I cut a little recess in the mating side of the large pergola rafter support beams kind of like a little uh, roof like a little tiny roof overhang so that way, when we assembled it, the sheet metal would kind of tuck up in there, and if water fell off from the top of the beams, it would it would drip down, and then it would drip onto the copper flashing, and then drip further down. So there was really no way that water could kind of sneak its way uh, underneath and and get onto the uh, to the wood. There you get a good look at how the end of the flashing is upturned so that it can go up into where the, the roof overhang is. Uh, this was some very tentative and careful forklift tractoring to get these onto the truck. I was uh, I did not want to drop these and get them all scratched up. Even though I, I brought all four on the truck from Oregon when I went to get this material, I, uh, I did not want to stack them when they were all finished, so I did two at a time and you can see all the rafters that are that were also prepped and I believe we put finish on the on those two so that they would shed water so we loaded up the two beams in one trip and then we did the other two in another trip and started bringing all the materials and staging them on the site for the install that was all the fabrication it was quite a bit of work and I really was excited to get this thing installed. In the next and final episode of the Pergola build series, we will conclude by doing a great raising of the pergola, install the rafters, and attach it to the house and do all the final trim and fit up. So I hope you can join for that one. I hope you learned something. And thank you for watching, and we will see you next time.